Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Prashant Kumar, and welcome to this uh, webinar series on the indoor air quality and respiratory infection. I'm a professor and chair in air quality and health and the founding director of center, which is called the Global Center for Clean Air Research at the University of Surrey. I also uh, wear another hat of Associate Dean International for the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. So before I go further, I just like to remind uh, two um, housekeeping notes. The one is uh, about the recording. So this uh, webinar is being recorded so you can, uh, so that you can see it later on on demand. And uh, during the seminar, you can, a webinar, you can have your questions answered. There is a little box there, it says Q&A, so you can post your questions. And then uh, after the webinar, I can, uh, you know, put them to Professor Lidia Moravaska, who is the speaker for the day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to give a very quick background of this uh, webinar series. So there is a, uh, this is a um, ODA supported research uh, from the University of Surrey and the EPSRC. Uh, we call it knowledge transfer and practical application of research on indoor air quality. So in short, KTP IQ. Uh, the idea of this project is to, um, uh, you know, to have a knowledge exchange pl platform across the ODA countries with a aim to share and discuss, you know, the state of the art best practices on indoor air quality and respiratory infection. So um, we have around 12 ODA countries who are directly involved in this, in this network. Uh, they come from, represent 13 cities. Each city has got a, uh, you know, the co-investigator co or principal investigator. And, uh, um, and each of these partners having the PhD research and postdoctoral researchers involved in it. So the network in, includes around 40 re researchers uh, at different levels. Uh, there is a little bit of history to it. So this is uh, uh, basically building upon uh, two projects which we have been running uh, from the last three years. So the first one was called Care Cities, which is the clean air engineering for cities. And uh, these are the, uh, you know, these uh, countries in Latin America, we got Colombia and Brazil, where we are focusing on. In Middle East, uh, we got Kurdistan, uh, in Iraq and Egypt. And then we have the Southeast Asia, where we got uh, um, uh, Bangladesh, China, uh, you know, India, <clears throat> and uh, um, in Africa, uh, we got, uh, uh, you know, the Malawi, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and uh, we added a, a, another, uh, you know, the country uh, during the process, which is uh, Nigeria. So these are the cities actually where we have been kind of focusing. And uh, the, the first part of the project, they started in 2019. So the idea there was to look into, uh, you know, the, the exposure, uh, in, in car exposure. So what's happening in the transport microenvironment? And it was quite a unique kind of an, uh, you know, the study which was designed in a D, DIY manner. And all the partners basically run, uh, you know, their, uh, their work or their experiments actually in their cities. But once we finished that, so the university and uh, our funders had been quite generous actually to support this network. So we got a, a follow up project which is called the Care Homes where we have, be, we have focused on the aerosol exposure inside the homes and the ventilation. And again, there has been uh, studies uh, carried out during the pandemic time uh, in, these, uh, uh, you know, in these cities. So we are, we are currently you know, analyzing uh, you know, the, the data. So, um, so we have a, this series of webinar where we got uh, around seven webinars which are already kind of settled down. So we might add another one or so uh, during the process. So the next one will be on 29th of October. The first one is today, which is uh, 13th of October. Uh, you can, uh, we'll, see, we'll propose the link. So if you are interested in the, uh, the follow-up webinar, so you can, you're most welcome, uh, you know, to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, attend. So what I'm gonna do now is I like to take this opportunity to, um, to introduce uh, our, um, uh, you know, the, the two days uh, the opening, you know, the, the colleague, uh, Professor David Sampson, so to open the webinar and introduce our webinar speaker. So a little bit about Professor David, David Sampson. So he's the, the vice, uh, the pro vice chancellor of research and innovation at the University of Surrey. And uh, uh, with a, um, with a um, uh, 
with, with, the, with the portfolio responsibilities for research innovation and the Surrey Research Park. He is a member of the University of Surrey Executive Board and the director of the University of Surrey Seed Fund and Satisquare Square Limited. David sits on the editorial board of the Conversation UK and the executive boards of the Satisquare Square Partnership and Sprint. As an active researcher, David has returned in 2021, RAF 21, and is active in the global optics and photonics community, and currently as advisor to the board of directors of the SPI, which is the International Society for Optics and Photonics and the chair of the SPI Publication Committee. David was earlier at the University of Western Australia and is a fellow of the AIMBE, IEEE, OSA, and SPI. So um, welcome, David, and over to you to introduce our uh, speaker of the day. Well, thank you very much, Prashant. It's a, a real delight for me to be with you. Um, let me just make a few brief remarks before I introduce our speaker, Professor Moravska. Um, Actually, it's not long now to COP26. Um, we're, we're all very excited about a once in a generation opportunity to showcase the UK's sustainability credentials. Um, and I think this webinar series uh, makes a strong contribution to that. Um, so this series on, on indoor air quality and respiratory infection, as you've heard, continues a long tradition at Surrey of distinguished research on the environment and on sustainability. Indeed, Surrey was the recipient of the Queen's Anniversary Prize for work on safe drinking water and sanitation in 2011. And even before that, in the early 1990s, what became the Centre for Environment and Sustainability pioneered the sustainability field, now commemorated in the annual Roland Clift Lecture, which happened last month. And the Centre continues to go from strength to strength and be well represented, will be well represented at next month's COP26. So today, uh, Professor Kumar's approach to air quality research epitomizes the Surrey way. It's impactful with his guide on proactively reducing air pollution in the school environment being translated into 30 languages. Uh, it's local, uh, working with community groups to design desired outcomes and then pursuing the research to achieve them. It is global, engaging with cities and researchers across the planet on air pollution as we're going to see in this seminar series. It's multidisciplinary, engaging with academics across the university in many different disciplines and beyond. So Professor Kumar's example is exactly the sort of research we seek to promote through the university's strategy refresh, forward thinking and doing. A major plank of which is the creation of a pan-university institute in sustainability, in which uh, Professor Kumar's work will play a major part, as will uh, our speaker, uh, Professor Lydia Moravska. Uh, she is a distinguished professor at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, and the director of the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health, also at QUT, a collaborating centre of the World Health Organisation. She is a vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Surrey as part of the Global Centre for Clean Air Research. Professor Moravska, in fact, is a physicist and received her doctorate at the famous Jagiellonian University in Krakow in Poland for research on radon and its progeny. So she has come a long way um, from those days. She is an author of over 800 journal papers, book chapters and refereed conference papers cited more than 125,000 times. That's a prodigious figure. Time magazine recently announced Professor Moravska as one of the top 100 influential people of 2021. Uh, they wrote, and I quote, Lydia Moravska stands out among her peers for her work in recognizing the importance of aerosol transmission and marshalling the data that would convince the World Health Organization and other authoritative bodies to do the same. She assembled a team of more than 200 scientists and public health authorities to recognize the role of aerosols in spreading SARS-CoV-2 and change how we measure and lessen our risk of contracting the virus. We are delighted and honored to welcome Professor Lydia Moravska to present to us today. Over to you, Lydia. Many thanks, Professor Samson. Many thanks, Professor Kumar. Many thanks, colleagues, for inviting me. And let me first share my screen to make sure that everything is on the screen. I'm assuming now that uh, you can see my screen. 
Yes, all right. Um, well, I'll be talking about indoor air from science to policy. Um, this uh, topic of um, infection transmission is, of course, part of indoor air, and I will bring it in into the uh, into this presentation. But the picture I'll be painting it is is much bigger. Um, I will start uh, from saying a few words about perception and awareness, indoor air, the complexity, impacts of indoor air pollution, paradigm shift, use of science and technology, and then what is the real challenge. Now, each of these topics could be a topic for a whole presentation. So obviously I'll be just, well, as I said, painting a picture, just giving some um, few uh, most important aspects of this, but not trying to exhaust the topic. Perception and awareness. Well, you see the uh, word water here, and uh, probably uh, you wonder whether I just mixed up slides. We are talking about air. Well. Let's do a little mental exercise. Imagine that you um, were in a restaurant, in a, in a bar, and they offered you a glass of water looking like this. Would you accept it? Well, what a silly question, of course not. Um, you would immediately ask for a clean glass of water, which you would receive. Well, the same with food. If the food smelled wrong or looked wrong, well, you will be very unhappy about this and immediately uh, will or, um, ask for and receive something looking much better. What about air? If they offered you bad air, not, not smelling good air, not looking good air, would you accept it? Well, now you wonder what does this mean? What does it mean that air is, is good? Well, if it looks like this, if you look during the day at the sky and it's blue, you would say it's clean. If it looks like this, or when you can't see across the street, um, it's polluted. But the reality is that in most cases, people cannot tell whether air is polluted or clean. And if you are offered a seat uh, at a curbside in a restaurant, just a meter or two from cars, well, it is definitely polluted, but you will gladly accept it because this is the ambience and you won't think for a moment that this is air pollution. I'll put it in a slightly different um, terms. Uh, we often talk about great outdoors. Uh, each of us has the, uh, our own ideas of great outdoors are, but if we were to describe what are the characteristics of great outdoors, we would probably at least something like this, beautiful nature, serenity, and people very often say fresh air. Well, what about great indoors, if we can use this term? Well, I'm not sure whether this is every, everybody's uh, idea of great indoors, but whatever you can think um, a great indoor to you is, what characteristics it would, would it have? Well, good design, comfort, vista to outside perhaps, quiet surrounding? Would you think for a moment about um, good air? No one would list good air. This issue of good indoor air quality came in a sort of very sharp focus during this pandemic, where it well became very obvious that we have no idea how good, how clean the air is, whether it contains viruses, whether it presents a risk to us or not. So this is a big challenge, that issue of perception and awareness or lack of it. So let's talk a little bit about um, complexity of indoor air. To summarize it, indoor air is a dynamic mix of pollutants, dynamics of, because of emissions, because of the uh, interactions, because of changes, um, characteristics with complex physical, chemical, and microbiological properties. And I think it doesn't take a lot to convince um, uh, you all that it strongly depends on the type of environment as depicted in this uh, selection of um, photos from different types of environment. So what affects indoor air quality? Well, first of all, sources we operate or introduce, conditions we create, for biological agents, and I come back to this. 
we as a source, pollution that comes from outside, and factors, factors related to all these aspects. So if we put it in a slightly different way, um, what are the factors affecting concentrations uh, of indoor air pollutants? So indoor air source, uh, building characteristics, the way we operate, ventilation rate, mixing rates, meteorological condition, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. These are just some of the uh, examples. One uh, very important aspect of this is that some of them also relate to energy. Energy is a very important aspect in all of this because buildings consume a well, significant part of energy we as a society uh, consumes. And uh, energy consumption or, or decrease of energy consumption in the future is a very important factor. So let's talk a little bit about a few of these aspects. Um, well, um, air pollution from outdoor, so how, what's the relationship between indoor source versus outdoor origin? And just of one pollutant, uh, indoor particles. One would think that, okay, if we talk about, say, similar environment, let's say an office or school classroom, they shouldn't be perhaps such a big difference, but it is. If we look at, um, the, uh, as particles, but even if we are talking about particles, there are many, very many different ways to characterize particles and measure them. Um, most common is by um, measuring mass concentration of particles smaller than uh, 2.5 micrometers or 10 micrometers, so-called PM 2.5 and PM 10, or particle number concentration, which are mainly very small particles, typically particles smaller than 0.1 micrometer, uh, usually called ultrafine particles. So let's look at uh, what are the sources of these particles in homes, schools, and offices, as we characterized in our uh, paper published in uh, Environment International a few years ago. So if we look at home, the the significant source is within the home, and I will talk later what are the sources of home, as well as outdoor for PM2.5 and PM2.5. So particle number comes from inside, particle mass com comes from outside. Now school, well, it's the other way around. The majority of the subparticle sources are those generating particle mass, and this is larger particles, but smaller particles come from outside. For offices, on the other hand, all particle mass, particle number come from outside. So this shows the complexity of the source. Uh, now, what are the sources of indoor particles, the indoor sources of particles? Uh, and uh, again, this depends on the environment as, uh, as the previous slide uh, implies. But if we just focus on a residential environment, it is tobacco smoking, it is cooking, vacuum, vacuuming, dusting, and sweeping. So all the uh, activities that uh, resuspend the particles um, and distribute them, heater stops, and other, like, for example, candles, incense um, sticks, which we bring well, for entertainment. Now, we, as a source of particles, and here we are talking about atomization of particles from our respiratory activities. This is a very, very complex process and um, occurs across the different um, parts of our respiratory tract. So starting from the lower part uh, in broncholi formation of the particles um, during a burst, uh, during subsequent inhalation, which produces the particles. And these particles are usually the smallest. The majority of, uh, of the particles we generate and the particles are the smallest. Uh, slightly bigger particles are generating from larynx. And here it's the um, reason for this is vocal cord vibration when we speak. 
this is the activity which generates by far the most particles um, among all the respiratory activities. And then finally is the uh, mouth and interaction of saliva in the mouth, and this is during the speech articulation. These particles are usually the biggest. Now, the point is that if there's a virus in any of this part of the respiratory tract, the virus or bacteria for that matter is also aerosolized or atomized, uh, atomized and introduced into the air. And finally, um, to um, conclude this brief run through the um, sources, indoor source contribution, biological agents. What are the biological agents? Now, the first is that we don't generate uh, biological agents like we generate combustion particles or the sources we operate, but often create conditions under which they propagate. And here, the name uh, on this uh, WHO guideline document, dampness and mold, mode is the keyword. So this is the one of bio type of biological agents. So this presence of moisture in the building, general lack of cleanness, and specific type of activities in certain types of environment. So we look in the corner of many of the environments we, uh, um, we spend time and we see mold uh, on the walls. So this is just trying to give you a flavor of the complexities of indoor environment and um, air, uh, air quality in our interiors. Now, we wouldn't be probably talking about this if there was no impact of um, uh, impacts of indoor air pollution on something and in particular on our health. But something we need to realize, and I'm sure we do, that, um, that we spend the majority of our times indoors. This is the nature of our, well, contemporary lifestyle, usually about 95% or more, which means we inhale particles which are indoor, in, indoors, and, and we are talking about exposure to these particles. Some years ago, we did a study on uh, inhaled particles and this is, we focused on um, schools and um, children uh, in Brisbane. We uh, investigated 25 schools then. And we specifically looked at this parameter, surface uh, area dose of uh, particles, um, ultrafine particles attributed to different microenvironments. So don't worry about this specific parameter, just, <coughs> excuse me, think about ultrafine particles. Now, so we have um, the different environments, commuting, home, eating, home, other, sleeping, and so on, school, school outdoors, as I said, school children. <coughs> now, interestingly, if we look at this commuting, compare commuting with sleeping, isn't this interesting that commuting, where we would imagine that the concentrations of this particle are much higher, contribute the least to the dose, inhaled dose, and sleeping is among, at home is one of the most significant contribution. Well, why? Because the time we are at home sleeping, it is much, much longer than uh, exposed to um, pollution during commuting. If we look at it differently, uh, at the um, uh, relative intensity. So then, of course, commuting is much higher because that even well, one minute in the commuting environment uh, increases the dose, dose significantly compared to one uh, minute at home sleeping. But the point is that we are much, much, much longer time at home, which is in general in indoor environment. Now, another way of uh, summarizing this is from exposure now to the actual health effects. And we are talking here about um, comparison of the situation in the rare quality and associated DALIs in 26 European countries. Now, DALI is the mean for, um, for bringing together all the aspects of the impacts of um, pollution in this case, and it, it means disability adjusted life years, which means all kinds of health problems, disabilities. So what we have here, we have different countries uh, uh, with the European Union, and uh, we have two colors. Blue, national burden of disease, 
expressed in DALIs, uh, years uh, per million, from indoor exposures to pollution originated from outdoors. Now, because as we've discussed before, this outdoor pollution penetrates indoors and that there we inhaled. And also at red contribution from indoor sources. So as you can see, there is a variation between the countries, but in general, if we look, if we, if we look at these values in all the countries, there's a significant contribution to um, burden of disease from inhalation of pollutants indoors. There is a different way of looking at this, and this is uh, in terms of what are the key exposure uh, sources. So that's from the same report. Now, uh, looking at this pies, the ambient air quality, which is what's penetrated indoors, is one of the most significant contribution. And then we are looking at uh, heating and combustion equipment and products related to this, water systems, um, building sites, and then other furnishing, building materials, uh, and so on. Or we can look at this, what are the most significant exposure agents? Uh, which is in other term pollutant, pollutants not always. So the biggest pie here is combustion particles. So that combustion is from traffic on the um, uh, outside and any other combustion sources, let's say power, power, um, power plants, which also contribute to, um, out, uh, to um, urban air pollution. Now then building dampness, remember I mentioned this mold, Bioaerosols uh, in indoor air, radon, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds. So there are different ways of looking at this, but this is not the end of problems. Ventilation and infection risk or infection risk indoors. It's not a new topic uh, at all. Um, when I first got into the topic soon after or during SARS-1, um, this is um, when I started looking in this droplet fate in indoor environments, or can we prevent the spread of infection? And then there were many, many other people, uh, papers investigated the role of ventilation of airborne, in airborne transmission uh, of infectious agents, viruses and bacteria and so on. So these are the impacts of um, indoor air pollution at a sort of very big glance. So let's talk about this paradigm shift using science and technology. Now, I was quite um, interested uh, or very interested reading in uh, 2014, this uh, issue of the Time magazine focused on the smarter home. It was a double issue and contained many articles on this. So what were the, just summarizing this whole issue, what, what, did, what does it mean or what did it mean according to this, um, the, the articles and what are the main aspects? So meaning energy efficient, self-sustained and making your life easier, enjoyable. Was there anything about um, indoor air quality and health? nothing at all in none of the articles. So one uh, example of what that smart home would do is slightly busy diagram, but imagine this person, this girl comes home and then all these devices, lamp, kettle, music, um, start doing what, what, uh, what is programmed, what she likes, the right lights turn on, the right music playing, kettle is on ready for coffee. Well, do we need this? Perhaps, but we need much more clean air. Um, soon after, it just happened that uh, under the leadership of my colleague um, Prashant Kumar, um, we've looked into, um, well, kind of extending this into um, that smart buildings, smart homes, into using sensors for indoor air monitor, uh, monitoring. Uh, challenges ahead um, in deploying them to urban buildings. Um, now we had a such different title for this, but the editor didn't like the title. Well, basically technologies ahead of its time. This was something like this. But our conclusion then was uh, that uh, in particular, we demonstrated the awareness of indoor air quality risks. I highlighted this because I'll come to this 
term and uh, um, uh, the uh, aspects of um, availability of appropriate regulation are lagging behind the technologies. So the technologies were not the issues here. Well, so here we are, is the paradigm shift to combat indoor respiratory infection, uh, which we called for in um, our science paper, building ventilation system much, uh, must get much better. Um, so there are many aspects of this, which are very briefly discussed. I've also discussed it, this in much more practical terms in a, an article in the conversation um, titled Australia must get serious uh, about airborne infection transmission and what to do. It applies not only to Australia, to basically every country. So strategy step one approach. What is this? We need a paradigm shift in how buildings are designed, equipped and operated to minimize all air risks. So the term air risks, as we mentioned in our paper with, with Prashant a few years ago, including airborne infection transmission. So it's not only one risk. And this all risks are characterized here in this slightly busy diagram. So during the pandemic, we are talking about this mitigation of airborne infection. But at any time, there's the issue of indoor anthropogenic sources. So it's control of the sources in the first instance and uh, pollution removal of uh, what the sources introduce. Now, there's prevention of ingress of outdoor pollutants. Uh, in Australia, bushfires were a wake up call for the country uh, where, where air quality is usually better than many other places, but it was horrible and it was horrible for many, many months. But think of many busy streets in big cities everywhere, there's very high pollution and we need to prevent this um, getting inside. Now, dampness and mold uh, is, which I've already mentioned, if the buildings are not properly designed, closed up, this is what uh, develops and has significant health uh, implications. And in all of this, we need to remember about thermal comfort. So all this has to be taken into account at the stage of building design, design of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system in the process of building operation and remember about energy, minimizing the energy demand. It's not that we don't have solutions. The solutions are schematically presented according to, uh, to, to, to what we had in our paper, the design occupancy, demand control, personal ventilation. And there are many, many other solutions. There are solutions. Um, in relation specifically to um, infection transmission, we are talking about the specific building engineering controls for this, such as sufficient and effective ventilation, avoiding air recirculation, particle filtration and air disinfection. Now avoiding overcrowding, which of course relates to the, how the building was designed for what purpose and therefore how many people it, it hosts. And this is schematically presented here on this diagram. I'll just say a few words about this aspect, sufficient and effective ventilation. What does this mean? Sufficient means basically enough of it, in simple terms, and effective means everywhere without, say, leaving dead corners. But in relation to infection uh, prevention or uh, risk um, uh, lowering, in particular, the aspect is that airflow not from one person to another. This is this is critical. So again, if we to, to look at a schematic presentation, this in the top panel here, there's not enough of ventilation because this particle generated by this infected person, let's say, uh, everywhere in the room. In the lower panel, it is better, but still there are pockets of air which um, a higher concentration of the particles. Now, do we ever wonder if there is enough ventilation in our office? Maybe now we do, but I bet that before the pandemic and well through the pandemic, no one really thought about this. But it was uh, many years ago, like six, seven years ago, 
when I visited a colleague at a German research institute, and we had a meeting of five people, people in large room, appeared well ventilated, high ceiling, one window open, some kind of mechanical ventilation. Now, what was significant is that they had this design, th this monitor at the wall. So it was quite large, so you could see from, uh, from, from a distance. It displayed CO2 concentration, carbon dioxide, and also temperature, relative humidity, and this system of traffic lights. So the meeting starts, and the concentration is relatively low. Just it, it's a bit over the uh, outdoor background, and it's green. Now, I must say that I was transfixed to this monitor. Just what would it do? Now, one hour later, towards the end of the meeting, despite that what I thought would ventilation, we are already reaching top of the amber and reaching towards red. Uh, so, and then I, when I ask about this device, why do they have it uh, on the wall? They said, well, this is typically or often used in German schools so teachers and students know what is the ventilation. So this is not an exotic co uh, concept or something which came, came up now during the pandemic. We have these technologies and they are used and very useful. So strategy step two, standards. Ventilation standards must be developed that explicitly consider health, part of this infection trans uh, uh, control in the statements of purpose and definitions. If this loss is in building, uh, in ventilation in standards, nothing will happen voluntarily about this because even a little increase in cost will prevent uh, implementation of this. And st strategy step three, the economy. Here, there must be a shift in perception that we cannot afford new ventilation systems. It's always this idea, well, this is expensive. Who will pay for this? How much it will cost? But the reality is that the economic cost of the impact of indoor air, not just infection transmission of pandemics, what we are talking about, but indoor air pollution by far exceeds all other costs. And there have been many papers on this and many assessments done. Now, in relation to this pandemic, the cost of COVID uh, is monthly of the order of $1 trillion. Cost of other transmission, uh, and this we are talking about influenza and respiratory infections in US before, the, before COVID, of the order of $50 billion uh, annually. Similar cost in Australia, which is of course much smaller, is up to about one, one, uh, 140 million. And uh, every country has this kind of uh, assessment. It is not that all the costs uh, will, be, will disappear and all the infections will be prevented if we have a better operating buildings. But even if we uh, have it, which is possible, considering the airborne transmission is the most important mode of transmission, the savings would, would be incredible, really. So now the last aspect, what is the really real challenge in this? So let's compare the situation um, of indoor air with outdoor air with the management, because now we are talking about management of air quality. So when it comes to management, of outdoor air quality, WHO develops air quality health guidelines, and they normally serve as the basis for national standards. Uh, and national air quality standards are enacted based on health effects of the pollutants and the economic impacts of controlling them. So it depends on the country. Of course, some countries can't afford to have uh, the national standards at, at the level of WHO guidelines. Other countries cannot, not now, but uh, um, trying to get to, to, to this stage. And most countries have outdoor air quality regulations. Uh, I should just mention that um, about two weeks ago, WHO announced a new air quality guidelines, and I had the privilege to be a co-chair of the WHO guideline development group. And uh, if um, you have a chance to look at this, you'll see that the concentrations of uh, recommended are significantly lower for basically all the pollutants considered than the previous 2005 guidelines. 
So this is management of outdoor air quality. Now, when it comes to management of indoor air quality, in relation to what WHO does, now there is uh, the uh, 2010 document which considers um, um, this specific uh, pollutants. Um, there is also a document which I already mentioned, dampness at mold. Now, it's, the issue is that it's only qualitative. There's no, no quantitative values. There's a separate document, household fuel combustion, which is basically also qualitative. Now, you may ask where are pa uh, where's particulate matter? I mentioned particles before. Now, this is considered to be the same as the WHO air quality guidelines. Now, this immediately tells you that this is more complicated because there are many different documents to manage indoor air quality, even as prescribed by the WHO. But what's the situation at the national level, national standards? Now, the reality is that most countries do not have any indoor air quality standards. Uh, there is no directive guideline or standard at the EU level in relation to indoor air. Less than 20 countries have national indoor air quality standards or guidance or even plans for them. Um, only several European and Asian countries have promulgated national indoor air quality standards or health guidelines. None of them include airborne pathogens. And um, in most countries which that have uh, indoor air quality standards, there are no enforcement procedures. Now, isn't this amazing how under, under managed indoor air quality is considered to outdoor air quality? You may ask how I know all of this. Um, we've just finished drafting um, a chapter for this handbook of indoor air quality. And this, this we've looked at, uh, at the situation at the international level in relation to indoor air quality standards. So this doesn't look very good. Now, you may ask, what are the factors contributing to, to this limiting progress in manager or no progress? Um, well, globally, it's a very complex political, social, and legislative situation regarding indoor air quality. Lack of an open, systematic, and harmonized approach. So it's everywhere like this, basically in every country. Now, of course, there are differences between the countries. Different countries have different um, problems, but while well, looking at the list, um, you, you can select what are the problems in, in a specific, so typical issues. No single national govern, uh, government authority resp responsible for indoor air quality. For example, will we consider healthcare facilities, it would be Department of Health. If we consider schools, it would be Department of Education who takes care of um, buildings such as office buildings or catering or buildings like restaurants. There are many different authorities responsible for this. So also responsibility is spread between different organizations. Uh, environmental legislations as well as health legislation are very different um, and a discretion of individual states, provinces, no federal. So again, you can choose what's, what in a specific country, whether state, province, or any other uh, the, um, the division of the country. Now, extremely important, there are no performance standards for indoor environment, only design and operational standards. I'll come back to this point. Um, then occupational environments are treated differently to residential. There's lack of funding for indoor air quality evaluations. And finally, if there are any assessments done of indoor environment, indoor air quality, it's only available um, um, to building owners and normally it's confidential, no one knows. Now again, where this list comes from, how do I know this? Um, I did a summary of this for Australia, and if you look at the date of this presentation at the Indoor Air Conference in Finland, this was in 2000, 20 years ago. And unfortunately, nothing has changed over these 20 years, and the situation is very similar in most countries. So just last point on the performance versus design operational standards. What does it mean? So. 
outdoor air legislation is based on performance standard, and this means concentration levels of pollutants are considered. So we know that the level of PM2.5, PM10 is of a particular value, and this has to be adhered to. Now, what does it mean the, um, in relation to indoor environment? The um, uh, operational um, uh, maintenance standard. So, so this is factors considered, like for example, air exchange rate, filter specification, or material emission rate. So this is specified in building codes, in building operation procedures, but. Uh, while all of them are dire directly related to indoor air quality, but um, it's not the only one responsible for this. So with, all, with some of them working properly, most of them working properly, no one's checked checks whether the concentration of pollutants is um, uh, adherent to every, anything. And, it, and we can't check this because there are no indoor air quality standards. So this is where the problem is. This is not really science and technology. We have science. It is this complex political legislating situation, which, well, doesn't allow to progress. Now we are talking about paradigm shift in relation to clean indoor air. Has this been done before? And I'll just reflect of something in many of you uh, listening in London know much better than I do. Um, with the, starting with the um, sanitary, sanitary report by Sir Edwin Chadwick uh, in 1942, and then the Clean Air Act, Metropolis Water Act, which was passed 10 years later, to, um, and this is a quote, to make provision for securing the supply to the metropolis of pure and wholesome water. How big problems and how contaminated water was and what the impact of this was shown in 1951 during the cholera uh, epidemic by this famous experiment, if I can call it like this, by John Snow. Um, and then from the end of uh, 1955, all water for domestic purposes was required to be um, properly filtered. So even looking at this date, it took quite a lot of time. So we can say that, yes, it has happened. I mean, the paradigm change, it has been done before. It did happen, but it didn't happen overnight. So it was not from immediately after this um, re sanitary report that we had clean water flowing from our taps. So we want to have clean indoor air tomorrow, next week, or even next year. But that paradigm shift must occur. So with this, stressing the complexity of this uh, in relation to air quality and particularly indoor air quality where science, awareness, technology is intertwined with politics and the complexity of this. But with all of this, making clean, healthy indoor air the norm is our objectives as scientists. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor uh, Lydia Morawska. This has been this was fascinating presentation. It uh, it covers uh, uh, you know all the, the issues actually which we are currently facing, but also provides a very in depth uh, you know the understanding of where we started long back, and as you rightly said that it's been like twenty years uh, when you kind of summarize those bits and they're still lagging behind. So there is there is a lot to do in this domain. And uh, um, and I think th this is an area where um, you know there is quite a lot of you know the initiatives not only coming from the governmental side but also from the regulators and uh, you know the um, uh, the environmental uh, you know the groups and so on. I guess everyone has a role to play in that. So um, I've been looking into this uh, you know these questions. So there are a number of very good questions coming to your way. But before I pick on pick on them. I just wanted to ask you one thing. You mentioned about uh, the, um, you know, the uh, the ventilation, increasing the ventilation, uh, which is uh, really important in the given, uh, you know, the circumstances. Uh, what kind of real, you know, the challenges you are seeing when it comes to the implementation of those things, especially, uh, you know, there are two categories of things. The one is more on a domestic level, 
with the whole household kind of, you know, the label. Uh, the other one is more on a commercial setting. Do you see the challenges are different and uh, uh, how can they be overcome? Well, it, it depends how the ventilation system is designed. Uh, most domestic um, settings are, uh, means natural ventilation. Natural ventilation is relying on, uh, on opening windows uh, and if the windows cannot be open for whatever reason, being too cold, too hot or too polluted outside, then the windows are closed and there's basically no ventilation. So, uh, so, and there's really not much which can be done about this without really changing the design of, of the buildings. Uh, in um, with commercial buildings, the situation is different and mixed because some of some of the buildings, some of the interiors are also naturally ventilated. Just think about schools. How many schools are naturally ventilated, which means not ventilated when um, windows are closed. But of course, there are buildings which are mechanically ventilated, which have proper ventilation. So there, there's a very big mix of, um, um, of the different buildings. But one sort of um, pro uh, issue between all of them is that in most cases, we, we really don't know what the ventilation is. Even if the building was designed for a specific scenario, uh, it may not quite operate according to this scenario and no one really checks properly the ventilation or ventilation in different zones of the building. So the, the sort of the very, very first uh, aspect is to do, um, to check what is the ventilation. Because this tells us, is there a problem or is this not a problem? If there is a problem, then the next step is what to do. Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. So there's a question coming from Dr. Abu Ludu uh, from Nigeria. He's asked that in developing countries, most of the homes lack adequate ventilation and mostly overcrowded. So what are the implications of these? What are the ways forward? Uh, well, this is this situation is certainly in the developing countries, but uh, as I said, it's not only in the developing countries that lack proper ventilation. Every building which is considered naturally ventilated, it's not ventilated at all if the windows are closed. And that's, that's what we see in Australia in the um, naturally ventilated classrooms, for example, I come back to the issue of cl classrooms. If we have 30 kids in the classroom, relatively small interior, Windows are closed, it's not ventilated. So the situation of overcrowding and uh, inadequate ventilation leads to problems and the problems of uh, infection during the pandemic, but not only. We have every year, as I mentioned during the presentation, we've got, we have epidemics of cold seasonal uh, mm -hmm. flu and other respiratory diseases. So inadequate ventilation always leads to this kind of problems, but think also from another angle. Um, uh, even if there's no pandemic, no epidemic, no infectious diseases, we all ex exhale carbon dioxide. So I mentioned measurements of carbon dioxide um, as a proxy for ventilation. But the issue is, if there's no ventilation and there's accumulation of carbon dioxide, while it is not a pollutant at this concentration levels um, affecting our health as such, but it makes you sleepy, tired, lethargic. Well, if we are going to bed and you are lethargic, maybe it's not a problem, but then think about the kids in this classroom, it's not ventilated, and we want our kids to perform. Uh, the academic performance is affected by this. So, whether, so, it, so the problem of overcrowding and inadequate ventilation is a problem of developing countries and also of developed countries. Yeah, thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, we got another question from Cassis. She asks, uh, um, is there any way or proxy to quantitatively estimate the indoor pollutants concentrations of particle numbers or particle mass given the outdoor concentrations and house household activity data? Well, um, there's been uh, many papers published over the years of the indoor-outdoor uh, relationships. Um, and there are some assessment being done about this. And for example, that paper, which I uh, mentioned and uh, showed the, uh, the contribute, uh, contribution of different pollutants to the uh, environment of schools, um, offices and homes, it, that paper also gives um, um, some kind of overview of, um, of the concentration levels of different pollutants. But the important point is that each 
indoor environment is different. So we cannot predict based on some uh, well publications that in if in general in schools this is the concentration of PM two point five PM ten or particle number. So in general that in this school or in this office or in this house it will be the same. To find out we really need to do measurements. The same as we do with outdoor air. We don't predict that in London the concentration is the same as say in Paris and based on Paris measurements. We do measurements in London and we do measurements in many places in, La in London. This is the only way to know and the same we should do with indoor environment. That's great, yeah, thank you. Uh, we've got a colleague from Claire, uh, Claire Watt, uh, uh, I guess she's from Australia I, um, uh, and she's asking a question. Um, uh, it's more of a, uh, you know, the kind of comment than a question and interested in your thoughts. In Victoria, Melbourne, the DHHS have issued guidance for schools, which is to currently rely on masks and opening windows, deployment of HEPA filters underway. In the meantime, the planning scheme is about to be amended to further increase the current policy of building schools on major roads, traffic through life fares. Uh, the incongruity of the two concurrent issues have been very disappointing. So it's not really a question, it's just uh, you know, picking up your thoughts actually, what do you think about this contrasting kind of situations here? <laughs> well, Claire summarized it very, very well. <laughs> There's no doubt about this. Well, I, I must say that uh, Victoria is the first state in, in Australia where anything was done uh, or something was done about uh, um, um, ventilation and indoor air quality in relation to pandemic, in relation to schools. Um, there's, uh, there's such conversations only taking place now in the uh, in New South Wales, nothing yet in, in Queensland. So, yes. um, so there is obviously a very big problem. Yeah, um, we got another question uh, from Srinivas. So uh, he's asking that SO2 guidance, uh, the 24 hour average guidelines, uh, you know, um, they have been kind of um, only 24 hour guideline is specified for SO2, as SO2 also contributes to the formation of secondary pollutants. What do you think is the reason behind this? Uh, particularly other guidelines are very stringent. The uh, this relaxed it, right? The SO2 guidance. So yeah, yeah, the, 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 this, this, this um, uh, is in the new WHO guidelines. Well, the, the reason it's not, the, the, the reason that it appears to be relaxed or it is relaxed is, is because that um, uh, this was a very um, stringent um, uh, process of assessing the impact of all the pollutants and all the pollutants in the same way. So it's not that something so, so, so changed in relation to what SO2 uh, does or doesn't. It was just the process which was applied to mm -hmm. all of the pollutants as a result of application of this um, process for all the other pollutants, the values went down, went down quite significantly, but as for SO2, based on the, on the data we have, it, it went up. Okay, we got another one from Matthias Kerja from Denmark, a good colleague. Uh, if you have the option of natural ventilation, open windows versus air conditioning in an office room, what would be your preferred option? Well, uh, if <clears throat> the climate is like uh, here in uh, Brisbane, subtropical climate, mo most year, uh, um, during the course of most year, I can open the window and should be able to open the window. Uh, and it would be good if I could, because normally uh, the temperature is good, air pollution is very, uh, the air quality is very good. So I would much more prefer to be able to open the window. But the problem is that um, the modern office buildings are not um, designed to be able to operate in, uh, in a flexible mode in natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation. So the, ideally, the building should be flexible such that if it's possible to open the window, to open the window, which may need to be supplemented by increasing airflow to provide enough ventilation through the whole building, say a big open space uh, office, but it needs to be closed because of um, thermal conditions or pollution, it's, it's closed. So, so of course, I would prefer to open the window, but uh, if it needs be, needs, needs be close the window and then operate in, in air conditioning mode. Yeah, so we, we got a couple of, uh, a number of other questions. 
sure whether we have enough time to cover all of them, but we might take another two or three, maybe just keep it short. So this one is from uh, Professor Maria de Fatima uh, from Brazil. So, you know, a good colleague again. Yeah, hello. hello. <laughs> I'd like to ask if the worst problem is the question of the emissions related to cooking. That is very difficult to show the impact and incorporate the population. So I guess- so The question is the impact of cooking. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a very big problem with cooking considering that about one third of the globe's population doesn't have access to clean fuel and cooks um, using um, solid fuels, which result with um, significant emissions and then exposure to incredible uh, concentrations. So, so it is a very big problem and shifting to, to clean energy and enable people to cook with clean energies is just a key um, element. So I'm not sure whether this was the question. Uh, the next, uh, the, I'll take two more actually, uh, but, but just to finish, the one is from Hon, and uh, the question is the IAQ brilliantly presented, uh, buildings in big cities are accessed by people who use public transport. Would you like to comment on IAQ on trains, buses, trams, taxis, and even private cars? If you solve the building problem and not the public transport problem, are we missing the point? Would you like to also comment on the notion of ventilation passports for buildings and how best to demonstrate to people that buildings they are visiting are safe? Well, the first question uh, about transport, well, by all means, the, everything which I said in relation to air quality uh, in buildings applies to transport as well. Of course, transport have different challenges because um, uh, density of people in transport is often much, much higher than density of people in, in any building. So these challenges have to be taken into account. And particularly during the pandemic, when we try to, to, uh, to um, uh, separate people as much as possible, this is not happening in transport. And then even good ventilation may not be enough and then the, the masks are necessary. But by all means, uh, the same issue of uh, uh, clean indoor air applies to transport as it does to, uh, uh, to buildings. Now, in terms of passports, uh, yes, I fully support this. And I think uh, I support the notion that in the future, not only those German schools, which I mentioned, will have CO2 monitors um, um, on the walls, but every interior should have a CO2 monitor, unless we find a different, better proxy for this. Now it, this appears to be the best. And this would then, well, make people aware whether there's a problem or not, and would operators of the building accountable for provision of clean air. So mm -hmm. I see that this is really the future. Yeah, okay. I would like to apologize to a number of colleagues who have put uh, uh, the question. They will try to kind of answer them offline. But I'll take the last question from Peter Damon. Mechanical ventilation could clean us recirculated air with high efficiency, low energy air filters, useful in cold winter times to reduce heating energy. So is this useful in cold winter times to reduce heating energy? So I guess yeah. the question is related to um, uh, the, the high energy, low energy. High, yeah, yeah. high efficiency, low energy air filters. Yeah, yeah. Well, by, by all means, if we, um, if, if, if we need to condition the air, so whether heat it or cool it, um, so if we just take fresh air and we don't recirculate it, we then uh, would use significantly, significantly more energy than if we re recirculate it. But if we recirculate it, then we need to clean it before it's re-entered, and then filtration is um, filters are the uh, ways to do it. On this diagram in uh, one of the slides, when I mentioned the, venti venti uh, the um, building engineering measures in relation to uh, to, to, pan to uh, infection transmission, but to anything, I've, I've mentioned this aspect of filtration. So yes, filtration is very important. Yeah. Um, I believe that there has been a number of other questions and I can only apologize uh, to colleagues not being able to pick all of them, uh, uh, but we will try to uh, see if we can answer offline. Um, so this recording will be there. Uh, uh, you know, you can visit the, uh, the event page, which you can see in the chat box in a while. Um, and uh, uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, our uh, 
uh, you know, the speaker today, Professor Lydia Muravaska, it's been real pleasure. And uh, you have gave a very, uh, you know, the stimulating presentation uh, on the topic. Um, and thank our, uh, you know, the, the Professor uh, David Sampson uh, for opening the webinar. And also a number of colleagues actually who have been working uh, in the background, including from the event team and a number of my colleagues from the GKR who have really worked hard actually to, to publicize and to put all this uh, you know, the agenda. And obviously all the partners uh, you know, coming from uh, you know, the, the different countries. So you will see a, a series of exciting seminars, webinars uh, coming up uh, you know, in, uh, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the next round. And the next event is on 29th of October, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., which is the GMT. And uh, we got uh, two of our colleagues uh, coming from Brazil and Colombia, Professor Maria de Fatima and Professor uh, Iris Olaya. And you will hear actually their views in terms of uh, uh, the Latin America, you know, the kind of perspective where the science is in terms of the indoor air quality and, uh, um, you know, what are the, uh, the, the, the situation uh, what are kind of mitigation measures are and what are the challenges there. So you're, more, you're welcome to attend you know, the, the next session. So with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining and uh, uh, hope to see you in the next webinar. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting.